So the first question goes that what actually got you into metal music at first place? How old were you when you recall hearing metal for the first time? Right. So, of course, when I'm young, I'm hearing, you know, Ozzy Osbourne and stuff like that on the radio. But I was really raised on punk rock, psychobilly and goth music. So Sisters of Mercy, Bauhaus, Alien, Sex Fiend, you know, down to uh, I loved a lot of new wave stuff, Love and Rockets and stuff. I, I uh, a lot of psychobilly stuff, Rock and Rebels, of course, Stray Cats, The Cramps. I mean, I could go on for days, uh, but that's the music I was raised on. And then sometime when I was about 15, 16 years old, um, I was at a friend's house. Actually, I was a stand-up drummer in a psychobilly band when I was 15. And I was at the guitar player's house, who was like four years older than me, and his roommate, who had long hair and was upstairs doing bong hits, <laughs> was listening to Black Sabbath. Okay. So that was my like, who is this? What is this? And then I got a tape with crumb suckers on it, a, a tape with crumb suckers on one side and another band on the other side that I thought was a punk band until I saw that they had long hair and that was Motorhead. Okay. So that's where I started to be like, okay, this is, this is for me. I love this, you know? Um, and I probably, be, I mean, I was in psychobilly bands and punk bands and I probably would have gone the direction of musically of going in that direction um, but punk at the time, you know, late eighties, early nineties was getting really pop punky and stuff. And I, I just changed directions. Um, obviously found, you know, I had a couple bands before Cold Chamber, but then found Cold Chamber and then the rest is history. So what made you pick up the microphone? Were you like influenced of like some punk vocalist first or how did that happen? Um, you know, look, I, like I said, I was a stand up drummer in a psychobilly band. I've always loved drums. I just decided to sell my drum kit and and pick up the mic. I just, I wrote a lot as a kid. So I read a lot and I write a lot. And I just thought, okay, I, I started to write lyrics and I was like, I want to, I want to be a singer. Um, <clears throat> and I'm influenced by a lot of guys, man. I mean, I'm influenced by Glenn Danzig is a huge influence on my clean, my low clean vocal, like the song Wishing, like that's Sisters of Mercy-ish, Glenn Danzig, uh, Definitely in the beginning influenced uh, by White Zombie, for sure. I love Rob's vocals. A lot of Motorhead. I mean, as a matter of fact, Devil Driver covered Ace of Spades for like our first three or four years. We played it on every show. Um, and then real punk rock. So I say like, you know, black re the real Black Flag, uh, germ uh, the Germs, Dead Kennedys. Uh, you know, I could go on for days with my my punk rock influences, really, you know. But <clears throat> amalgamation of a lot of different things, right? So I also love the blues. So there's a lot of influences. I mean, I was raised on Elvis. So oddly enough, that's a definite influence for me. Um, song structure-wise, my songs are really reminiscent of like, you know, how Psychobilly or Rockabilly, guys like Elvis actually structure their songs. I mean, you, you're never going to hear a four and a half, five minute song really from Devil Driver. I mean, maybe four minutes, four and a half, but never longer than that. So yeah, those are, those are the basic influences. So you mentioned that you had like two bands before Cold Chamber. So were there like those like metal bands or rock bands or, or what type of yeah, band? Yeah, yeah, you were in? yeah. Yeah. Like um, <clears throat> the one early band I was in, uh, I would say I was probably in my early 20s, uh, 19 to 20, 21 years old, was called Pile Driver. And it was very okay. reminiscent of like Motorhead, like very reminiscent of that four on the floor, chun, 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 chun. And I had found a growl type vocal within me by then. Um, and over the years, it got heavier, got stronger, got deeper, got lower. You know, if you listen to my vocals on the first Cold Chamber record, you listen to my vocals on Dealing with Demons 2, which is the record that's coming out for Devil Driver. Way different vocally because I just, I seem to get more powerful uh, over the years vocally. So then I try different stuff and yeah. So the first couple bands were, were metal bands for sure. And then before Cold Chamber was a band called She's in Pain. That was a, a band actually with Meigs, the guitar player for Cold Chamber. And that was heavy as well. Like very heavy. Almost, I would say heavier than Cold Chamber, for sure. Because then when Cold Chamber came in, we started with all these different influences, goth influences, all these different influences, you know what I mean? And She's in Pain was like a strict 
metal band. So, so when that, you start, that's the, yeah. So when you started doing like more more metal type of vocals, were you like first sort of like mimicking your idols and then sort of like figuring out your own way to do things, or or, or how did like that vocal progression happen like in the early days of your career? Right. So when I listen to back to pile driver tapes, which I still have, and we used to put like a blaster up in the room and just tape ourselves and then go home. No, I, I, I wasn't mimicking anybody. It was a, I, I really kind of had my own thing from the start. And I actually, I've never been asked that question. So okay. great question. <laughs> great. And actually makes me think, no, I, I always kind of had my own thing. I mean, like even, even like now saying, you know, Elvis is a huge influence. It's like, you can't really hear that in devil driver, <laughs> you know, but it's a fact. So, so, um, it just, it just kind of, I, I kind of figured out my own style early on, very early on. And I knew that I wanted something rhythmic. I really knew I wanted something rhythmic. So like, I love guys like James Brown, you know, I love a lot of soul music. I, I, I love funk, like real funk, like parliament and stuff. So I wanted something that had, had some movement, had some feel, had some heart. I come from psychobilly. I wanted something with four on the floor and some movement. And it all kind of just came together in an amalgamation that made my first band and, and now Devil Driver. So where are you like first making covers before you started writing your own stuff? And and if you were playing covers, what kind of, was it like Motorhead covers, Black Sabbath covers in the early days or what, what type of music? Uh, right. So one of the first bands I was in, we actually were covering, uh, we covered Am I Evil by Metallica. Uh, we covered a couple Danzig songs, but I would say after a couple months of that, like I got extremely bored and the band that I was in really wanted to do these covers and go do covers live. And I was like, I don't want to go do covers live. It's not, you know, what I want to do. And so I left those guys and, um, that was in Orange County, California, and then moved to LA. And that's when I started to really find my way, you know, because people up there were hungrier. And they wanted to rehearse more. They wanted to play out more. They wanted to go to the clubs and, you know, be known. And so that's obviously was my direction. So when you formed like Gold Chamber, were you already like ready as an extre extreme type of vocalist? Did you already have the stamina to do like full proper shows or, or were you still yes. sort of like figuring out your own way to do things? No, 100%. I already had it. And the first... uh First time we all get together and started to jam, I, I knew we had something unique for sure. And then we started to, you know, Meeks uh, with his guitar started to down tune and we started like, you know, started to do a bunch of different things. And uh, yeah, I had it already vocally. So but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still, still finding myself as a vocalist. I don't think you ever stop learning. Um, when we laid uh, the track Wishing that's on volume one, Dealing with Demons volume one, That was like even a learning process for me because I can sing clean. That song well, is, by the way, amazing. Like, Sorry to interrupt you, but that song is like top notch. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I, I, even then, I was finding myself with the producer. And he would be like, "You're a little too low," and I'm like, "Well, that's that's my register, you know." And he's like, "Okay, let's 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 bring in this register of a vocal." And I and I was learning even then. So I don't think you ever stop learning as a vocalist. I, I think once you do. Uh, you know, the game is up. So what kind of memories do you have when it comes to like the first proper tours that you did? Was it like a learning experience to be on the road and were you, was the like voice or, like okay to do many shows in a row or did you have some difficulties? Did you learn anything on that tour? Uh, we would rehearse every day and play shows almost every weekend. So I was already ready to go the distance and play five, six, seven shows in a row. Our first tour, my first tour was with a band called Downset. Yeah, I know. Um, and we were only out with them four or five days. I love the band. We were all friends in LA, obviously. But when we got on tour with them, we were not getting treated too well, <laughs> to be honest with you. And the fourth, uh, there's a story. I have an autobiography coming out between June and, and August of this year. It's already done on Rare Bird Books, but there's, the story is actually in the book of this. But we played a place called the Trocadero in Philadelphia. It's no longer there. It's an old theater. And there wasn't many people there for Downset. And of course, Scroll Chamber was just coming out. Our record hadn't even really dropped yet. And I looked up in the balcony, an empty balcony, 
And I saw what looked like Glenn Danzig. Now, keep in mind, when I was a bricklayer uh, working construction, all I would do is listen to that first Danzig record every single day. And I was a huge fan. And now, even now, him and I are very, very close friends. I think, you know, he's going to write the uh, the forward to my autobiography, actually, Glenn is. Oh, cool. So, so I look up and I see what looks like Glenn Danzig and I'm, I'm like, okay, this must be the whiskey talking. And I got off stage and I went up backstage and I went up to our room and no, he was actually in the room and he said to us, hey, great show. I'm kicking Power Man 5000 off of my tour tonight. And I said, oh, bummer for them. You know, you know I don't like to hear that. But he goes, I want to bring you on and we're playing a sold out show in Philadelphia and we have six more weeks. Can Cole Chamber do it? And I said immediately, I jumped ship immediately, which I probably wouldn't have done if we were if we were getting treated better. But there wasn't a lot of people coming to those shows for downset. You know, so it was a great, a great vibe. Those were my first two real tours. And then after that, the band started to really kick off, man. And we toured the world, uh, you know, several times with Pantera, several times with Black Sabbath in uh, soccer stadiums. I mean, uh, unbelievable. You know, I came from a place of of leaving home at an early age, literally sleeping under bridges in L.A. and stealing food and going to jail to now I'm on tour with Black Sabbath in soccer stadiums. I don't even, <laughs> you know, I look back and I mean, I wake up every day grateful and humble and appreciative every day, but I, I look back at that and I just, you know, I think to myself, wow, you know, like. So obviously you. obviously you were like very young around that time. And now, like you said, you are a professional band. So how how different is like your warm up routines nowadays for the shows? Did you have like any back then or was it like just jumping on stage and started screaming or? No, no. I mean, I was told long ago, uh, never warm up too long because you're just killing your voice out, right? So I have two rules. One, and this is this is from the early 90s, I don't sound check because if I go out there, I warm my voice up, I do one or two songs and I'm talking loud and now I go back, I cool down and four or five, six hours later, I got to get back on stage to do the show. My voice is a wreck, a total okay. wreck, a, a absolute loss, to be honest with you. Um, and then warm up for me is I, I actually sing the chorus to Ace of Spades a couple of times like literally you know the ace is fit you know literally yeah, i yeah. said a couple of times and if if my voice has that yeah that growl that thing in it that warmness which actually it has right now thank god <laughs> uh then i know okay i'm prepared but if it's a little too dry or a little too cold then i go into the me 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 you know all of that for five minutes ten minutes and then i go back to growl and if i can hit the growl then i know i'm good to go okay uh, You know, yeah. And 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 she's done me right over the years. I mean, I've been I've been on the road sick for two, three weeks and been able to do shows where a lot of guys would probably cancel just because of the style that I have, you know. But if I was doing real high, clean vocals like uh, you know, I guess Bruce Dickinson, Iron Maiden or something like that, I would definitely have had to cancel if I had the flu, you know what I mean? So are there like some certain foods or drinks that you wouldn't rather have before the show that you feel that they affect your vocal cords, for example, somehow? Yeah, I mean, over the years, um, and I realized this, I got sober in 2016 off of alcohol, but over the years, I realized that, that whiskey and cognac were doing a, a damage to me, for sure. I thought it was warming me up, and but no. You know, I've had people that have come out to the recent shows, actually ex-members of Devil Driver come out to the recent shows and actually say, bro, you sound better than you ever have. And, you know, and I attribute it to staying away from alcohol, which is which drives your voice out. I will yeah. tell you, like, there's a magic formula for me and it's watermelon juice. Okay. So real watermelons juiced in a real juicer. I'm not talking store-bought. Uh, real watermelon juice that you juice that I swear to God, if you're a vocalist do before you record a record, drink watermelon juice and you will see exactly what I'm saying. It's just, it's unbelievable for your voice. So obviously, obviously you've released a lot of albums with Cold Chamber and Devil Driver, but are there like yeah. some specific albums that you can sort of like pinpoint vocal wise that you have taken like massive step forwards? 
Oh, yeah. So, I mean, the first Cold Chamber record to the second Cold Chamber record vocally is massive step forwards. I listened back to that and there's there's some semi-flat, semi-sharp, but I think all the best singers in the world aren't like completely on key all the time. I mean, honestly, uh, and that's that's just finding style. And then there's some vocalists that are on key all the time. But they should not be trying to sing. It doesn't sound great, even though it's on key. So, yeah, I would look at like the second record of Cold Chamber for sure. I would say, you know, the first Devil Driver record to the second Devil Driver record is a total move forward vocally for me. And then the last kind words, uh, which is the third Devil Driver record, is is beyond the first record and the second record vocally 1,000%. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the reasons that people don't know, it's can actually come out of my book, but I'll talk about it real briefly with you, is I was overseas doing festivals a year and a half prior to laying that record. And, uh, you know, you take showers at festivals or whatever, and my ear, my left ear, uh, and my right ear actually got clogged up to the point where I was going to doctors, I was trying to unclog my ears. Like like when you go up in a plane, yeah. they weren't, op weren't opening up. And I was taking plane flights and everything else and they weren't opening up. And I was going to doctor after doctor. And this happened for like 13, 14 months, man. My oh, ears shit. were, I was doing shows with it, flying with it, which was extremely painful. Yeah, uh, I can imagine. Unbelievable. And it came down to laying the last kind words and I remember uh, we, we drove a bus there because I couldn't take any more planes. I was going to have to fly to Texas. And I said, no, I got to take the bus. I can't take any more altitude anymore. My ears are just, I don't know what's going on. And I laid that record on volume 20 in my cans because my ears were so clogged. And if you listen to the last kind words, my vocals are lower. My vocals are heavier. There's a lot to have to do with that because I couldn't really, I couldn't hear myself. So, but I had to get a record done. And now it's crazy. Like, it's like a fan favorite record. I mean, people are like, I love the last kind words. And I'm like, oh man, if you only knew, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and plus we were on a gallon of whiskey every night, you know, and I think that it, it added definitely to the ferocity of it. Although I'd love to lay that record sober now, I would kill it, you know, uh, so yeah, that's the story there. So were you sort of like learning like new voices out from yourselves because of having that clocks in your ears? I was, and plus I was working with Jason Sukoff at the time, who does a lot of death metal and stuff. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a massive, there's a couple genres that I don't really listen to a ton of, you know? And, um, you know, one of them is power metal. I mean, I really don't care, you know? And, 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 and there's some death metal stuff I love, but, you know, I'm not... I don't really go that deep. And if I do, it's a lot of newer shit that I love, you know? I like, I like you know, Prevail. I like Fit for an Autopsy. I think Lorna Shore is killing it. Lorna Shore you know, is that amazing. Kind of, that, yeah, that, that kind of shit I fucking love. And so I think working with Jason was a big deal because he'd be like, no, you need to go higher here. And I'm like, higher? Like a higher scream here? He's like, you need to go higher. Okay, no, you need to go lower here. I need you to be have a lower register. And I'm like, dude, lower than where I'm at? Like, and he's like, just do it. And we would do it. And I'd listen back. I'd be like, you know, a, a good producer will always hear something you don't hear. And a good producer will always lead you to paradise. You think you know the way. You think you know the pathway. I always, I always listen to the producer because they're going to they're gonna take you to Shangri-La if you, if you really listen to him. You know what I mean? So obviously dealing with Demos Vault, Vault 2 will be released on May 12th through Napalm Records. So are there like some certain things that you did like differently with the vocals or any kind of like new voices that you found yourself for this album? 100%. So dealing with Demons 2, yes, is coming out May 12th on Napalm Records. And the records are actually meant to be listened to back to back. Well, that's why they're so short. And they were supposed to come out a year apart from each other with, of course, couldn't happen with everything that was going on in the world. I did most definitely find different vocals. Uh, you're going to hear a song called This Relationship Broken. That is definitely has a lot of like melody in the scream, melody in the low vocal that I do. Um, yeah, there's a there's a there's a bunch of stuff that that I've learned 
uh, it, you know, with this record. I mean, I think the song that opens the record, I Have No Pity, absolutely is. I found some vocal, different vocal styles there. Um, the, the first track that we released, Through the Depths, I would have never done something two, three, five years ago that was like the verse that's there, you know, attention, attention. You ask for, you ask for, like, that's so open for me. I would have usually gone, you know, attention, I would have had all this crazy stuff. And I, so I've learned to let the, let the music speak to me, but let my vocal speak to me a little more. And like, what, what is apropos to the, to the song rather than what I think I want to do style wise. So yeah, I learned a great deal on dealing with demons one and two. Plus when you're laying a double record, man, of course you're going to learn. You know, I went through some very trying times with that record uh, with my producer because we tried to find different sounds. I mean, Wishing actually was a heavy vocal. It was okay. uh, Those verses, those choruses were all heavy until he finally said, man, listen, how come you don't use your real influences? You know, you're influenced more by Sisters of Mercy and Bauhaus than you are, you know, whatever, Metallica or whatever, you know. And I said, yeah, you're right. He said, let's try this clean. And I said, cool, put up the microphone. And I went in and like in an hour, I laid that song. I mean, I laid it in like three minutes and we listened back to it. I laid a couple more pieces and within an hour, we were sitting there like, holy shit, you know, like now what are we going to do? You know, here's the thing about Devil Driver that's great. We're not held to the fire like most metal bands. Most metal bands are held to the fire. You got to be Coca-Cola. If you change your formula, the fans are going to leave. Oh, we don't want to hear clean vocals. Oh, they tried to go too heavy with this record. Oh, it's not the band that I love anymore. Devil Driver has never been held to that fire. That's true. Every record for us is different. Our first, second, third record, way different. You listen to the record Beast, it's way different than Trust No One. Trust No One is way different than Dealing With Demons. So I think we have a leeway with the people that listen to our music, and I thank God for it, that we're allowed to kind of do what we want and put a song like Wishing on Dealing With Demons 1. And people came to us and like, man, we want more of this. And I said, yeah, you know, cool. Thank you for that. But it has to be right. That kind of a vocal, that kind of a song has to be right, you know? And it just was. It just happened to fit. I mean, it's actually Mike's favorite song too, my guitar player, my wife's favorite song. I mean, obviously, because it's about her. <laughs> <laughs> So I have, two, I have two questions left before we wrap things up. Uh, second last one goes that what were actually like your parents' reactions when they heard that you started screaming your lungs out in a metal band? Um, you know, they weren't real happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, they weren't real happy when I came home at age 14 with, you know, a huge pompadour and my first <laughs> tattoo at age 15, my first tattoo and wearing black stretch jeans with motorcycle boots with chains around them. And, you know, I was like one of the first people in music to tattoo their face. I mean, I remember when I got my first face tattoo, I remember Rob Zombie uh, telling my wife, oh, you're, oh, you're with Dez, you're with crazy Dez and referred to me as crazy Dez, you know I mean? I mean, I, they weren't real pleased with it. I mean, I remember at one point my mom, when I was like 15 years old, threw a bunch of my like my leather jacket away, my, you know, my spiked belts and, you know, I had big, big belt buckle, big. I mean, still to this day, I love big belt buckles, but, you know, I had a big skull and crossbone belt buckle and she threw it away. And, you know, they weren't they weren't real happy. They weren't real behind it. Um, you know, I, I think I came home at Christmas one Christmas and handed my mom a gold record for Coal Chamber. And she was like, what is this? And I said, you know, look, look, I did something right. You know, hey, 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 baby, we're going to be a star, you know, and and even to this day, like I and like she she knows what I do. And she obviously knows, you know, that I'm a known person. But, you know, I'm just I'm just always my mom's baby. I'm a mama's boy. And I, I love her for a long time. It was just my mom and me. You know, uh, you know, she just raised me alone a lot of the time. You know what I mean? Um, and even when she got married and had my stepfather, different stepfathers, um, it was always her and me, you know? So while she's very proud of me for sure, uh, she didn't like it in the beginning, but you know, everybody wants their kid to be, you know, maybe doctor or lawyer or whatever. I, I, I have three sons. I never raised them like that. I said, you know, don't even, you know, 
you know, I was the parent was like, you know, sure, go to schooling. If you want to go to college, go ahead. But there's a million guys with college degrees working at McDonald's. So A, do what you love. B, do what you love and have passion for. And C, follow through with anything you do. So like my youngest is a singer. He sounds a lot like me. He's guested on many Devil Driver records. Actually, you can go on YouTube. He came on tour with me on the last tour and sound checked for me every single day. Uh, oh. And I'm pushing him to do that. And looks like he's going to have a record coming, you know, hopefully this year, if not the beginning of next year. Um, my middle son runs several companies for me. Sun Cult, which we started as a family, um, also as a manager here, an assistant here and very business savvy. He's been in it from the beginning with me, knows all the agents, all the promoters, you know, and then my son Tyler is an incredible guitar player, but he's got a career of his own. So, yeah, I mean, my mom was uh, not pleased about it. I mean, because I, you got to imagine I'm 14, 15, 16 years old, sleep, you know, sneaking out of my my house to go to nightclubs you know, to go to psychobilly, rockabilly clubs. I was running with guys that were 18, 19, 22 years old. And I was 14, 15. I'd already had a tattoo put on me at 15 years old, which she lost, lost her mind about. Yeah. Uh, but fuck, I was, I was in the screaming wolves, man. And we all had tattoos and that's just the way that it went. And we were all 15. I mean, even now I'm good friends with my guitar player that was in the screaming wolves. His name is Buddy Doogie. He's actually on Instagram and he just released a record for himself. Uh, just now and he's still as rockabilly as it gets you know what i mean everybody know everybody knows that guy in the rockabilly psychobilly scene anything you want to say as an advice to a young metal vocalist who is just about to start the journey anything that pops up into your mind the the first thing that popped up is have influences but never sound like them don't ever sound like them i don't sound in my opinion you could tell me I'm wrong. I don't sound like anybody. And I can tell when a vocalist comes out and he sounds like somebody that it's like, come on, man. You know what I mean? So that would be, that would be my advice is, is, is go to rehearsal as much as you can. Uh, use your influences, but don't sound like them. Record yourself a lot. Listen to yourself a lot. If you start sounding like other people, make a change and make it really quick. You know what I mean? The best thing is when you can't find the influence was in within the vocalist. That's the best. That's the best thing because when you can hear the influence, that's a that's something you don't want because you're just going to be pegged on it for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? That's that's completely true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it goes the same, right? If you're if you're a guitar player and you've got influences, man, don't don't copy them. You know what I mean? Don't copy it. But of course, you have to have influences in this life in order to grow as an artist. I mean, every painter has an influence. You know, every guitar player, singer has an influence. Use your influences, but try not to sound like them. That's true. Why, wise words to the end. Hey, Des, thanks a lot once again for taking the time to do the interview with me. And all my, the best for the pleasure. release of the upcoming album. My pleasure, brother. And thank you very much. And uh, hope to come to Finland soon. And Pick up the new Double Driver record that's out May 12th on Napalm. And uh, yeah, pick up the new 69 Eyes record too. It's amazing, actually. It's probably one of the best things they've ever done, to be honest with you. That's that's a great album. Both are yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Yerke is a, a, he's a consummate rock star in a time when people are not anymore. And I love it. I love it. So, yeah, man, thank you very much for everything. And I hope to see you guys real soon. And I hope you enjoy the record, you know. Thanks a lot, Des, for the chat. Thank you, brother. Take care. Bye.